And can so somebody be socially competent if they don't make eye contact? I think so, yeah. So, you know, there are different, different ways of looking at it, but this is a definition um, that's been in the literature a long time, and it's a person's ability to successfully engage in social interactions and relationships with all other people. So, you know, that's kind of a generic definition, but what does that mean? Um, outcomes of social interactions, social competence means that, the, that you're, when you socially interact with someone, they're successful. So as we socially interact, they're either successful interactions or they're not. Now when you run into somebody and it's not successful, what do you do? You stop, right? You guys can speak up, it's okay. You know, you, this interaction can be reciprocal today. So when you run into someone who's socially and not very competent, the conversation kind of stops, right? And you don't know what to do. But think about it from a parent's perspective. You expect your infant or your toddler or your preschooler to respond in a certain way. The response doesn't happen. What do you do? You stop because you feel awkward. You feel it's not working. You, and then that's when things like joint attention break down. So, um, but social competence uh, um, are able, people who are socially competent are able to, Im uh, to initiate, maintain, and interact appropriately with others even in difficult situations. So the basis of early social competence, working on that as an infant and toddler and preschooler and building that is going to help children evolve. The little girl that I was talking about, Betsy, she's, I mean, she's great academically, I, she still has social competence problems. And you know, she's still working on that. So she can go to a third grade classroom and read, but they're keeping her in her first grade classroom because she's not socially at a third grade level. So they would rather have her social skills um, develop. Oops. So I'm gonna focus on joint attention first. Joint attention, again, is one of those uh, skills in the literature that people have written about and we have a bunch of references in the back of your packet that give you more information about joint attention but it's it's a hard skill to define so this is a definition of it coordinating attention to an event or object with another person sharing interest and social engagement and showing an understanding that the partner is sharing the same focus there's a wonderful article um, written by Schertz and Odom in Young Exceptional Children, and the reference is in the back. And it's a great article to give to practitioners or parents that just help you define joint attention. So we know joint, joint attention is more than just looking at each other back and forth. It's actually sharing a common interest. That's very hard for children with autism. Um, so, the foundation for joint, um, for the foundation for, or joint attention is important because it's a foundation for the development of language, social conversational skills, and social relationships. It's what we call a pivotal skill. Um, it's also the foundation for a child's ability to coordinate and share attention. It's the beginning of social communication. It's the beginning of turn taking. It's the beginning of sharing toys. Um, it helps children monitor the social environment. Um, one of the important parts about joint attention is shifting gaze. Looking at somebody, looking back at the toy, and looking again. Brian and I are gonna model this in a little while. <laughs> and then um, it helps the child focus attention on another or draw on another's attention of mutual interest. So that, these are key facets of joint attention. When we think about joint attention, we know that children can look at the same object, but whether it, for the purpose of sharing mutual interest, that's the hard part. Oftentimes with young children with autism, what I found is they're not really interested in the same things I'm interested in or sharing that interest. They use joint attention in much more of a functional way. So um, there has been literature that you can teach children with autism uh, joint attention and it's important to do. So, 
So joint attention is a set of skills that are strongly related to the ability to orient to a social partner, um, coordinate and shift between people, share and interpret emotional states, use gestures and vocalizations, and gaze. Um, so it's really about communicating with another person. And as I said, it is a it's, part, it's a pivotal response class behavior. So I know some of you have had training in pivotal responses, and joint attention is an important one. So pivotal skills are skills that when we strengthen them, they, um, they help facilitate development in other areas. And that's why joint attention is important. Um, and it's also a cardinal feature that we find impaired in children with autism. So I think with almost any child with autism that you're gonna work with, joint, and particularly young children, joint attention is going to be something that you can walk into a family's home and say, let's focus on joint attention. This is a skill that we can help you develop in your young children. Um, so children with autism, they don't tend to spontaneously seek to share enjoyment or interest with other people. Um, you can see the deficit in joy and attention before one year old. So when you're looking at diagnosis of children with autism or uh, early identification, joint attention is one of those factors that you're going to run into and, and family members might not know what joint attention is so we will have to educate them about it. But it's, it, it is something that's going to show up very early because you see it in infants. And there's two parts of joint attention, initiating joint attention and responding. Which one do you think is, is more difficult? Initiating, right. So which one do you start teaching first? Responding. Right, I mean, it's, it's kind of backwards, but initiating or responding are two different types of joint attention skills. Um, so um, when joint attention is affected, it eliminate, or it limits a children's ability to coordinate attention and affect with others. It limits sharing intent with others, and it leads to a very restricted range of communication behaviors and it leads to difficulties inferring another's perspective or kind of what we call theory of mind. I think you've probably heard that term, theory of mind. So joint attention is one of those behaviors that if I were to go into a home and work with an infant and toddler, immediately the, one of the first things I do is joint attention. You're also gonna have preschoolers that are gonna need joint attention and even school age children. There's lots of positive outcomes for teaching joint attention. When children have joint attention, they're more likely to initiate communication, use language, acquire conversational skills. They have more sophisticated gestures and symbolic language. They're able to repair communication breakdowns, and they're able to respond to contextual and interpersonal cues. So clearly, joint attention is one of the reasons that we want to um, we, we want to keep focusing on teaching that skill um, because it's going to help children in the long run. Um, so early joint attention. Uh, since joint attention ha is a complex skill, what we wanted to do is break it down into more simple skills so that you can look at the children you're working with and say, okay, where on the joint attention continuum would this child be and how would I go about teaching that skill? Um, it includes at least two people. It includes the use of gestures and gaze to share attention around an object or an event. So um, these are kind of the steps in what early joint attention looks like. You orient to a social partner. You coordinate and shift your attention between that person. You share and interpret um, affect or emotional states, so happiness or sadness or excitement, and you use gestures and vocalizations that are paired with either physical contact or gaze to deliberately affect um, or communicate with another person. So that last step is when I would say, aha, you have joint attention. But the orienting to a social partner is important 
coordinating and shifting gaze is important and sharing and interpreting emotional states is important. So it's not just pointing and commenting. It's a little different. It's actually interacting and communicating with another. Um, so this is just a, an example. Alex and his mother are playing in the living room and a car pulls up. Actually, this happened to me the other day, except um, my husband Dom and the dogs were in the living room and I pulled up in the car and he said, the dog, Kona, which is my dog, um, the dog barked and wagged his tail. Alex looked at the door, then looked at his mother and smiled and pointed outside. His mother immediately recognized Alex's intent and said, yep, Alex, it's your dad. And actually, my dogs did this the other day. They shared joint attention. I know that sounds so silly, but they did. They have early communication skills. So they heard my car pull up. They looked at my husband. They went to the window and barked. I don't think they quite did the gaze shift quiet to the extent, <laughs> but we're working on it, you know. And they didn't, um, they didn't point. They don't have the arm movement. Clearly, they're still in the developmental stages. This is something we see happen all the time. But there, there are components, and it's that sharing. It's that gaze shift back and forth. Um, so was Alex requesting anything of his mother? What was he doing? Was he, was he saying, I want this? No. What was he doing? He was just sharing an event. And what was the event? That dad was coming home. Right. So he was just sharing information with her. And I think that's a critical distinction between um, many of the early communication skills we teach. Functional communication is, is great. I mean, and, and we're going to show you some video clips about early communication skills and children asking for more. But we want to take it a step further. This takes that kind of instruction deeper. Joint attention is about sharing information for the purpose of sharing information. And that's the hard part, because that's not a skill that most young children with autism um, exhibit. So Brian, we're going to do, we're going to imitate, we're going to, Brian and I are going to do imitation of joint attention. So um, we're going to do, um, Brian's, Brian's the kid and I'm the adult. So, down low. no, no. <laughs> wait a minute, I should stand up here. So, um, so we're going to start and we're going to do a response joint attention. We're just going to do it with what the materials we have here. Brian, look at the screen. Yeah. Look at it. Isn't it exciting? <gasps> yeah. So we're doing that gaze back and forth. I'm pointing to something that Brian, the screen isn't that exciting, right? We need yeah. to have something. But I'm pointing to something that Brian's interested in, he's looking at. We're going back and forth. And it's just a, it's just a fun exchange. All right, now we're going to let Brian initiate joint attention. That was responding to. All right. I'm just, you know, Brian playing. It's a screen. Wow, look at that. That is so cool. Oh, I like that. So, you know, it's that exchange. I know that's silly, but we thought we'd just show you an example. Um, and I'm going to actually, there is a, a videotape that we're going to look at um, that one of the group sent me. And it'll show you some early uh, communicative behaviors of, of joint attention, too. So that's an example of what joint attention is. It's different than just asking for a need and a want. Brian's not wanting the screen. He's just looking at it. But what's a core component of that? If the screen's really boring, is Brian going to look at it? No. Am I going to look at it? No. How about if I think the screen's really exciting, but Brian doesn't? Is he going to look at it? No. So we're going to talk a little bit about trying to figure out ways that you can identify materials that will make joint attention motivating for, for children. Um, so early joint attention starts at nine months of age. That's young. And we want, we want, to, um, we want to target children. It's never too early to start teaching joint attention. And there are two components, form where we gaze alternate across, so we do that gaze back and forth, and then function, the social interaction around an object. 
So we already talked about there are responses and initiations for joint attention. You respond to another person's attentional desire, so another person is sharing information with you, or you initiate it with another person. And we talked about responses come first, and then um, initiations come next, and that responses are easier. Because it's much harder to, to start a conversation. So parent looks and points at an object and says, look, and excitement and enthusiasm. And then the infant looks back and forth, checking back with the parent. And I'm gonna, you know, I keep stressing that, but that's, the key, that's one of the key components. And alternating gaze back and forth. That's the beginning of social interaction. That's really where we start. Um, so an infant that initiates joint intent attention in response to the presentation of an interesting object, or they use gestures and gaze, and they say, hey, look at that. And it doesn't mean that they verbally say it. It means they look at it and smile or act excited. As a parent or an early interventionist, we need to pick up on that immediately and hone in on it and look at that and say, how can we get them to be excited about that? But it is a means of obtaining adult attention to show an object to another person. That's the purpose behind joint attention. But it's not a request for the object. The difference is the social intent here. So it's not, I want this. It's, I want to share this with you. Um, so what we want to do is teach joint attention. Um, and, you know, there, there, isn't, there isn't a, um, it's not a, you know, there isn't a way that you just do one thing and you teach joint attention. It's somewhat of a process. So you have a handout on different stages of joint attention, and I had this made as a handout in the back of your packet because the writing would be so small on the little slide. Um, and joint attention goes through different stages. So there's pre-linguistic, there's emerging and advanced. For the infants, toddlers, early childhood kiddos, we want to deal, we want to look at pre-linguistic. Those are really the best places to start. And these are early skills that you can teach to facilitate joint attention. So orienting to social stimuli or following another person's gaze. Um, smiling and looking. Looking at increasing communicative bids. So that can help facilitate social uh, uh, attention or a joint attention. Expanding communicative functions. So looking at teaching things like more, but then taking it a step further. Um, and then once those skills are in place, you want to look at developing repair strategies in children and when communication breaks down. And then looking at generalizing it across persons and different activities. So I would imagine that most of the young children that folks are working with here are looking at those first kind of three or four areas of joint attention. And those are early joint attention skills. Those are things you can start working on immediately. But when you teach it, you also want to look at the form, okay, whether you're doing um, initiations or responses to joint attention and the function behind it. So um, it requires social motivation. And um, with joint attention, the social motivation is sort of a, piece that we're going to have to embed in there to help children be motivated to engage in social um, joint attention. Um, but research says that you can teach joint attention to young children with autism. Um, you can manipulate the social context. And that one of the things they found in research is that, um, is that if you set up social situations, you're only going to have modest effects on teaching, on acquiring so, um, joint attention. So if we do adult-directed instruction, we're only gonna have modest effects. What we really need to do is look at child-centered situations. That's gonna increase the joint attention to a much higher, um, um, a much higher level over adult context. So that's why we wanna embed joint attention instruction into um, into early childhood settings or into naturalistic settings. Um, so what we want to do is focus on the parent-child 
attention. And it can be worked into classrooms with peers too, but this conference is really about infants, toddlers, early pre-K kids. So we're focusing on parent, um, child. Now in your handout you have sort of a, a hierarchy of joint attention as well. And this was something we created to help give you a framework for looking at when you, um, different levels. Remember we talked about services are along a continuum. So there are going to be some children that need more intensive instruction than other children. Um, but we want to first, and you can look at your, it's in your handout, it looks like this, it's a triangle. If you work in the field of special education, early intervention, you have to develop a triangle. Otherwise, your concept doesn't really have any, you know. And they're not pyramids, they're triangles. So anyway, um, some people call these pyramids, but pyramid is three-sided, so, or four-sided, I don't know. <laughs> but it's a triangle. But these are different levels of hierarchy for teaching joint attention. So you can start by rearranging the environment and then you might need to get a little bit more intensive and following, you know, doing some imitating and modeling, using some natural reinforcers. And if children still aren't getting joint attention, you go to a higher level. So you go to an intensive, more repeated um, interactions until the child starts developing the concept. Um, and um, let's see. So this would be an example of uh, instructional format that you could use to teach joint intention. So you want to increase the child's response to a bid for joint attention. Remember, that's where we start. And you place an interesting object in a motivating place, and the adult says, look, it's a, and then there's a blank and models joint attention behavior. And be sure to include the gaze and gestures. And be sure the child is highly motivated to engage in the object. That's, that's an important point here. It's got to be something they enjoy and want. And you're sharing that with them. And then you would look at incorporating time delay, where you would give them an opportunity to respond without just prompting them and making them respond. So that you would help encourage that natural process of looking at joint attention. And then you would reinforce them for engaging the joint attention by giving them access to the object for a while. So it begins, it maybe begins as an early request, but it turns into a social interaction in between that time. So as you're developing um, intervention programs to teach joint attention, you can also, you know, it's good to have a goal and then to outline for family members a teaching strategy. So as I said, the challenge is that the child must be taught that social interactions are interesting and rewarding and meaningful. And that's where we as early interventionists with young children with autism um, need to focus. So, we need to establish uh, social interactions with an adult as a reinforcer for children, because that isn't a reinforcer for many of these young children. For some it is, but for children with joint attention it deficits, it probably is not. And the way to do that is to pair social interactions with the adult with preferred things. It's just, it, you know, it's just the way we socially interact with other people. So I don't socially interact around other people with non-preferred things. It's not something I do. I don't spend my time doing that. So young children don't do that either. They want to socially interact around their friends or around their parents, around things that they are interested in doing. Um, and, and also, and we'll talk about identifying what those can be, but providing natural consequences. So making sure that through joint attention, that it, they get access to the object that they're really interested in. Or they get, you know, something that's very reinforcing for them as well. Um, and that, that reinforcement is idiosyncratic to them. So it could be a tickle, it could be praise, it could be excitement, it could be that they just get the object that they want. But focusing on something that they find very exciting is, um, is it needs to be embedded in the joint attention 
interactions. So with joy and attention too, what we found is that joy and attention is a difficult skill. So you want to you want to intersperse it with something that's easy for them to do. So you can make it contingent on playing with the toy. Joy and attention is difficult, but playing with the toy is really easy. So if you want them to, if they want to play with the toy, they have to just engage in joint attention before they're able to do that. Um, so when you look at planning joint attention interventions, the first place you start is assessing the child's current skills. Go back to that hierarchy um, or the, the stages and look at which of the prelinguistic linguistic skills that child has and say, where are we gonna start? What's the first behavior? We're gonna break joint attention down into these behaviors and we're gonna look at orienting to social stimuli and then maybe smiling and looking at each other about that. Okay, so that's the first place you start. You're gonna target the level, target the form, look at whether it's initiations or responses, and then you're gonna plan your intervention around that. You're gonna look for a reinforcing toy or a reinforcing object that you can use. You're gonna look for um, the salience of those objects. Sometimes one of the things you wanna to do to motivate a child to interact is to actually deprive them of something. It sounds a little um, mean at times, but as an interventionist, you, I have to set up situations that are really gonna encourage a child to interact. So if, if the child has had access to their favorite toy all day long, and early, as an early interventionist, I come in and say, let's play with your favorite toy, they might go, nah, not interested anymore. But if you can ask mom or dad to withhold that toy till you get there, they might be a little more interested. So sometimes you have to set up those situations that are gonna help you um, motivate the child. Along with joint attention, imitation, is, um, is a very important early communication skill. And there's different ways of teaching communication. And so I'm gonna just talk a little bit about what communication is and how the different levels of, or of what imitation is, the different levels of imitation, and talk about two practices that you can teach imitation with. One is very directed child, I mean adult directed discrete kind of trial. And the other is more an embedded natural learning way. You can tell from listening to me that I like embedded instruction, right? That I like naturalistic instruction. It just feels more normal to me. And I believe from the literature that I've read and the work that we've done that actually you generalize and acquire long-lasting skills a little bit better that are, or that are more in line with natural um, consequences. So uh, deficits in imitation and emotional perception responses and joy and uh, attention are all things that young children with autism display. But the um, ability to imitate, when you have an impairment in that, it's, it really is something that limits children's early social communication skills. So if you can imitate, you can, that helps you develop early communication skills. And we're not really talking about just plain Simon Says. We're talking about imitating motor and gestures and verbal behaviors. Um, so imitation in children with autism spectrum disorders, we know that they have difficulty doing what's called spontaneous imitations and gestures of play. It's just not something they normally naturally do. Um, and that it shows up in the toddler years. So.